Hi, this is the second part of our very first two-part episode. In order for this one to make sense, you should first listen to episode 53. It's called Melinda and Judy. We should also say this episode contains material that may not be appropriate for all listeners. Please use discretion. I vowed on the day that we buried my mom that I would find out who did this to her. And, you know, I lost my entire family because I was saying Clarence did not do this. And I had no support. It was just me and our two, and our two sons. And uh, so I decided I'm going to find out who did this. This is Melinda Dawson. We left her in our last episode at the sentencing of her husband, Clarence, who had been convicted of killing her mother and raping and assaulting her six-year-old niece. Clarence received two life sentences, and Melinda didn't believe that he could have committed any of the crimes he was sent to prison for. But she wasn't able to convince anyone else in her family. They wouldn't even speak to her. You know, I had no one for uh, emotional support, uh, I had no one for to bounce anything off of, definitely. Her mother was dead. Her niece had been assaulted. Her husband was in prison. Melinda thought that the only way she would convince anyone that Clarence had not committed these crimes was to find out who did. And that's exactly what she decided to do. She started by making a list of suspects and then looking into them one by one. She had no training, no money, and absolutely nothing to lose. I'm Phoebe Judge. This is Criminal. Melinda combed through area newspapers, looking for people who had been convicted of sex crimes in the area, and she kept adding to her list. After I, you know, put their name on the suspect list, then I started looking um, where they lived, what kind of charges they've ever had, uh, you know, things like that, and and making sure that I knew what they looked like. And, uh, you know, thank God for the Internet, um, which was pretty in its infancy at the time to try to look up people back at that time. But I got a lot of information from um, the same county that I was fighting, and and they had pictures and they had charges and dockets, court dockets, um, that I pulled together on these people. So the Hicks adoption stuff went on the back burner, obviously. A few years before her mother's murder, Melinda learned that she was one of at least 200 babies who had been illegally adopted from a small clinic in Georgia. They called themselves the Hicks Babies because the doctor who'd sold them to their parents was Dr. Thomas Hicks. The group had started searching for their biological relatives with DNA. The idea was to create a database of DNA samples from both the grown Hicks babies and anyone from the area in Georgia where they had been born. We were doing DNA uh, to see if uh, we could find any matches. I had uh, learned from that experience what DNA can show. I learned from watching um, crime shows and forensic files and just knowing that DNA is the answer to a lot of rapes and murders, um, and it's unrefutable. The police had collected lots of evidence from the crime scene at Melinda's mother's home, but only a couple strands of hair had been tested for DNA. And Clarence was not a match. There was no physical evidence whatsoever placing him at the crime scene. But somehow, that wasn't compelling to the jury. But Melinda knew that because only those hairs had been tested, there were more things to test, and that gave her an idea. Melinda set out to secretly collect DNA samples from each person on her list of suspects. Um, The first person on my suspect list, I um, found out where he was hanging out, and uh, right around, you know, and during the weekend. So I went on a Friday night um, to one of the local bars in Barberton, I was dressed kind of um, not like I normally dress. I'll put it that way. I I was um, 
you know, a little sleazy looking. And uh, I went in, kind of checked out the area and kind of sat down by myself and was watching, you know, him a little bit. And then he got up to play pool and I put a put my quarters on the pool table and he won um, against the other person. And so I was up next. And so we were playing pool and uh, I was kind of flirting with him and, um, you know, just just talking. And uh, my ultimate goal was to to get a cigarette. But however, um, the barmaid kept coming over and dumping the ashtray like every time somebody would put a butt out she would dump it and so okay I'm thinking it's the beer bottle I gotta get I guess and uh, he went to the bathroom and I had a baggie and I put that beer bottle uh, inside the baggie and left before he got out and believe me when I got to my car uh, and locked the doors and was trying, you know, to get out of the parking lot as fast as possible. I was literally terrified and, and thinking to myself, what are you doing? But once she had that first sample, she kept going down the list. Um, once they either went to the bathroom or, you know, went to talk to someone else, I, I got either their cigarette butt or their beer glass or a beer bottle and secured it and got the heck out of there. At one point, she even followed a man to a strip club and sort of flirted with him just so she could pull some hair right out of his head. You know, where the girls dance and um, the guys put dollar bills in their garter or whatever, and I had never really experienced anything like that. And so a lot of this was so shocking to me that you know, I had to really stay focused, but I, um, yes, I, I went up to him and we were talking and 